Uh, my name is Matthias Eid. I'm the global CEO of Faraday Future. And it's a pleasure to welcome you here on site, as well as welcome everybody who is uh, linking in to our live stream. <coughs> Some of you have been here. I've seen your faces around in, in other uh, ven events we, we had. And some of you are new to the Faraday Future family. We'll take you through a journey of Faraday Future for the last nine years or nine and a half years to get you to know what we did, what's, what's the idea behind. And uh, we'll share with you what we have done and what we are planning to do. First, I'll take you to this lovely legal disclaimer I will save the time for you and for me to read through it, as normally others are doing. So we have posted this on our investor relations uh, web page. And, and I invite you to take the time to read through it and make sure that you consider uh, that by taking away the messages we are sharing today. Thank you. So let me talk about Faraday Future. So our vision, which was created uh, from a basic idea in 2014 and, it and then developed and at the end formalized in 2016, 17, uh, is to empower everyone to live and move and breathe more freely. What does that mean? Basically, we are following our mission to perpetually evolve the way we are moving and the ecosystem we are providing, and we move by co- melting pot of dif different backgrounds, different industries, and different uh, values coming together to one very unique result, which is culminating in our FF91 as the first product on the road, the FF91 2.0 Futurist Alliance. So with that, we will start with the brand. John Schilling will take us through what are the ideas and the values behind, behind the brand of FF? Thank you, Matthias. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm John Schilling, uh, the head of communications here at Faraday Future. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about our brand, what makes up our brand. Um, you heard Matthias speak a little bit about the vision and mission, but what does that exactly mean? What does our brand stand for? What makes us stand apart from the growing group of EV competitors in the marketplace right now? Well, it's obviously about the product. And you will hear more about that soon. But what else makes a brand stand out? Our product is far beyond just a car that takes you from point A to point B. Our product is a mobility experience, a moving experience of a visionary new world that is focused on our users' individual time our product essentially gives you more time. A brand should typically answer the following question. If your brand were a person, what kind of personality would it have? What would that person's life entail? We see the FF brand, or person, as confident, worldly, technically skilled, and extremely intelligent. FF appeals to those who are creative, are visionaries, are determined, those who never give up, never take no for an answer, and are capable <coughs> and willing to drive transformation. Those are the people that will be attracted to our brand and our vision. Entrepreneurs, adventurers, scientists, and disruptors, these ultraspire futurists demand an upgrade in their mobility experience. They don't just want a car in their lives, they want an experience. Our customers, or users as we call them, are pioneers, courageously driving human civilization forward. They are futurists as we refer to them. Our product pays tribute to the futurists who are propelling the world towards a sustainable energy future. These entrepreneurial leaders, 
visionaries, and daring inventors frequently are cited as being the first to accomplish great things in their lives. Their work represents the vanguard in its field, singular creations that are defiant and challenging. You've never seen anything like them before. Difference is a driving creative force. Needless to say, the FF brand and its work is highly influential and different than our competition. The FF brand is active and engaged with multiple projects at the same time. Therefore, FF always seems to be in motion, moving quickly and acting decisively. It is willing to take risks for what it believes in and backs up beliefs with solutions that work. The FF brand is also an empathetic communicator, focused on creating experiences that foster deeper connections between people. Its mission is to challenge convention and push the world forward with smarter, bolder, and more audacious answers to our problems. FF91 is a user-centric experience designed for people with many talents, many obligations, and many goals in life. Faraday Future has addressed these complex needs in a single vehicle that combines the luxury of an intelligent connected space with the capabilities of a hyper-dynamic EV powertrain and predictive AI architecture. Together, these elements work to elevate a user's potential and provide them the ultimate freedom to do what they want, when they want, and how they want. Today, the aut automotive industry's core value is fundamentally shifting from mechanical and hardware to software and AI. In the future area of intelligent EVs, meeting the needs of the market will no longer rely solely on mechanical and hardware capabilities. Instead, software and AI will enable a single category to meet the diverse needs of every user. At the beginning of it all, just nine years ago, Faraday Future was founded with the pure intent of delivering a new species of mobility to our users. We got to start from a clean slate, not burdened by decades old processes and technology like many legacy automakers. The FF91 is an all-in-one intelligent vehicle that is your mobile office and your mobile media room. It is your supercar, your SUV, and your limo. This new species would come from our disruptive approach to innovation across intelligent technology, user-centric design, and EV propulsion. FF's relentless pursuit of revolutionary technology and uncompromising investment in RD have, have also become defining characteristics, characteristics of the company. The EV industry's transition to user-centric design was already disruptive, and we took it even further, sharing ideas with our users, hearing out, and implementing theirs. The ultra-luxury car civilization represented by traditional brands like Ferrari, Maybach, and Rolls-Royce may appear to be at the peak of their glory. However, we at FF believe the real disruption is just around the corner. Only intelligent EV companies like FF with superior technology, software, and AI DNA can lead this disruption. Now I want to turn this over to Arash, our director of design, to talk about the design of the vehicle, and then on to Phil, who will talk more about the technology and the product. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arash Badenlu. I'm the design director here at FF. Um, I also go by Arashi uh, for my visual work. Um, thank you all for being here. Appreciate that. Um, I guess I guess I'm supposed to tell you about um, FF Design. Uh, so basically, with FF Design, we we started with a clean clean slate. We had no baggage, whereas other automotive makers are stuck in their old ways. We use a non-automotive approach. The goal to create the most recognizable tech luxury brand. How do we achieve that? Similar to AI, FF design team created the building blocks to lay out the framework for the brand. Building blocks that define attributes such as details and proportions. How does that work? Let me show you. We take our car, what we do first, we pull the A-pillar forward. What does that do? It makes the car sleek. What else does it do? It maximizes the interior volume. Next, we organize into three layers. Then we color block. The upper layer, black, celebrates our, our interface. The lower layer, 
also black, celebrates our platforms and battery systems. Then we join them with a beautiful sculpture. The FF91 establishes the framework for our future vehicle designs. As you navigate around the vehicle on the exterior, uh, the UFO line, the UFO line is uh, one of my favorite uh, parts of the car. You'll notice this as you walk around the vehicle. It is also fo followed by a lighting array that can communicate with the outside world. This is a testament to, our, to AI-like precision, adding a touch of alien-like elegance to our visual signature. The third AI space. On the interior, the FF91 is a multifaceted robot. Whether you want to dr experience the thrills of driving, the productivity of an office, or the comfort of your home, the FF91 will transform to accommodate your desires as it takes you through a symphony of features and beautiful details, all held together by an advanced language of color, materials, and finishes. This encounter transcends conventional boundaries, presenting a fusion of innovation and aesthetics. In FF91, we not only focus on the driver, but its passengers. Each door are interactive displays, neatly tucked with, within the piano finish, hidden until lit. In the rear, you will discover two business class-like seats. Seats that are inspired by NASA, they fully recline into zero G. You could also summon a 27-inch display transforming an ordinary journey into an interstellar-like experience. I'd like to end on this note. With the FF91 on the road, now it would drive opportunities for future vehicle designs. We can use the AI-inspired algorithm to create endless variants, scalable up and down within a segment or out and beyond. Next, I'd like to introduce Phil Bethel, our uh, head of uh, vehicle line engineering, uh, to and he will give you some background on FF as a technology-driven company. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Phil Bethel, VP of Vehicle Line Engineering, and I head the FF91 program. So when you look at the FF91. From the beginning, the FF91 was developed to be an all AI, all hyper, all ability vehicle. We've accomplished this through our 654 architecture. The architecture has four technology systems supported by and integrated with six technology platforms. Together in the FF91, these systems and platforms deliver ultimate experience to our users. Now I want to spend a little time take you through the benefits of the four technology systems that are the foundation of the FF91, starting with the Magic All-in-One. When you look at the Magic All-in-One, it elevates the ground clearance of the 91, creating higher seating position for the drivers and passengers to gain enhanced visibility of the road, of head, uh, road ahead. Supported by our all-wheel drive capability, the vehicle transcends the confines of paved roads, embracing thrilling off-road experiences. The All-in-One body is a meticulously crafted with an aluminum intensive construction and innovative design, ensuring optimal strength and stiffness while minimizing weight. Together with, it, with its low center of gravity, the system minimizes body roll and enhances control. Drive and ride modes equipped with dynamic dampening are intricately linked to your individual FFID, adapting seamlessly to your multiple driving scenarios. Whether you're in sports mode for the racer, comfort mode for the entrepreneur, or SUV mode for the outdoor adventurer, the all-in-one concept, concept optimizes performance and driving dynamics. Now let's move to the hyper multi-vectoring. The agile performance and raw power are harnessed through our cutting-edge tri-motor propulsion system. These three oil-cooled, high power density and high torque density permanent magnet motors deliver, over th deliver combined power of 1,050 horsepower. 
making the FF9 one one of the fastest production vehicles, even outperforming traditional hypercars. All this power is delivered through a single ratio gearbox that delivers smooth acceleration and deceleration with zero transitions, unlike traditional automotive transmissions. With responsive braking and finely tuned dampening, this platform stimulates all your senses, providing an exhilarating driving experience tuned to deliver performance not available in cars of this class and size. The overall result is an agile and fun to drive vehicle that elevates the driving experience. Now we move to our third AI space. The third AI space integrates cloud, third-party applications, and of course AI. And combined with the FF AI OS 2, vehicle hardware to provide personalized in-car experience far surpassing traditional mobile internet solutions. When you add our 27-inch display, wide-angle 8-megapixel cameras, and noise-canceling mics, it's ideal for video conferencing or sharing presentation material. High bandwidth connectivity provides fast, simultaneous access to real-time news and market updates while on the go. The FF91 is similarly transforming leisure time on the go with an array of entertainment options. You can watch live sports, enjoy family-friendly movies, or just relax in spa mode. Our unique combination of hardware, software, and crazy fast connectivity creates opportunities for entertainment in motion. Our FF AIOS 2 supports and empowers you and keeps you always connected and in control of your FF91. Our suite of companion apps allow you to control your FF91 from anywhere. We're very excited about our many creative innovations and amazing features born from the synergy of AI, human iman imagination, and powerful technologies, and our continuous improvement mindset. Combining user-focused design with robust engineering delivers an unparalleled mobility ecosystem and platform. Incorporating user inputs lets us co-create our future together. Now I want to introduce something new. You know, before we launched the industry's first FF91 integrated GPT service back in May, and today FF is releasing a new app called AI Pal. This is the first of its kind generative AI offering in the mobility ecosystem. The FF AI Pal is the first generative AI product in a mobility ecosystem. It redefines a mobility experience based on advanced large language model capabilities seamlessly processes diverse mobility-related data, ensuring a highly personalized service. FF collaborates with third-party developers through an open model to integrate mobility ecosystems and AI services. And you'll be able to experience AI PAL today. Now we move to AI, AI driving. Our AI driving system builds on innovative technologies and ensures ultimate safety, freeing up the driver's time and attention, and provides a personalized experience to each of our users. The AI driving system provides functions of automatic emergency braking, adaptive cruise control, lane centering control, and in the future, other features such as smart parking, summoning, and navigation-based auto drive will be released after rigorous process of additional simulation and road testing. FFAI driving is enabled by three pillars, a world-class sensor suite, powerful computing platform, and in-house software development enabled by AI technologies and a big data pipeline integrated into our vehicle. FF91 is also equipped with the LiDAR, high-resolution cameras, radars, and ultrasonic sensors. We're the first automotive OEM in America equipping production vehicles with a high-resolution, ultra-long-range LiDAR. The LiDAR in the FF91 can detect objects up to 500 meters away, even in low-light conditions. Our dual 8 megapixel dash cameras have both 60 and 120 degree field of views, greatly improving ADAS sensing capabilities. We also have side mirror cameras, B pillar cameras, and surround view cameras to cover 360 degrees around the entire vehicle. The FF91 is also equipped with radar and 12 ultrasonic sensors. A combination and fusion of all these high quality sensors allow us to reduce missed detections and false alarms, providing extra redundancy and further enhancing safety. The FF91 is equipped with one of the most powerful production-ready SOCs from NVIDIA, called NVIDIA Drive Orin. It can handle many deep learning networks and applications running simultaneously. In summary, the FF91 is equipped with world-class sensor suite, 
and powerful computing platform. It achieves ultimate safety and delivers the best individualized experience for our users. Now, these four systems are supported by our six technology platforms. FF Open App for application development, FF AIOS for user interface systems, FF AI Hardware 2.0 for second generation computing platforms, FF Mechanical for structural EV and safety systems, FF Cloud for computing and storage, and of course, FF AI for language and other AI systems. As with everything at FF, the platforms are continuously being upgraded and improved. Now, future development plans include integrated third-party developed plugins via our open platform, and to utilize the vehicle as part of a generative AI database. FF is also actively working on enhanced performance packages and AI racing technology for improved track experiences. These systems will continuously improve via internal strategies and with our co-creation partners. Now I want to introduce the FF All Hyper Racing program. This program was started to stretch the limits of traditional vehicle performance by targeting track records around the globe. The team's goal here was to improve the performance of the 9-1 through racing development program, where we really stress the vehicle and put it to the ultimate test. The outcome will be a performance-oriented version of the FF9-1 that exceeds the boundaries typically ascribed to a vehicle of this size and mass. Currently, we've set the fastest lap records for SUV category at Button Willow and Willow Springs International Raceway. At Willow Springs, we beat the Lamborghini Urus time of one minute, time of one minute and 28, one minute 28.313 seconds. And this was an improvement of seven seconds from our first track day back in June of this year. So it really shows the improvement in the product that we've been able to achieve in such a short time. There are more improvements to be made, and many of these will find their way onto the FF91 Performance Edition in the future. So with this technology backbone, let's look at the innovative and tech luxury FF9120 Futurist Alliance. Here you can see from the spec sheet, we've brought all this together in a very high performing vehicle, tri-motor layout, incredible zero to 60 times, 381 miles of range, incredible braking distance for a vehicle of this size and mass, and the 1,050 horsepower. All that together delivers the best experience for our users. Then when you add our third internet living space and external sensors, we deliver the whole package in the FF91. And now when you look at where we are today, we've completed phase one, delivery to industry experts and co-creators. Now we're in phase two delivery, and we'll be looking to move to phase three delivery by the end of Q1 of next year, where the vehicle will be sold to the general public. And with that, Terry, our head of co-creation, will share what co-creation is all about and what it means to FF and our co-creation partners. Thank you, Phil. This is Terry. Uh, I'm heading the user ecosystem system together with the co-creation strategy. So I would like to introduce the what is FF co-creation and why the co-creation is valuable to FF business. So in short, FF co-creation is an open platform where users partner with FF. However, it's not just only the partnership. It is the embodiment of FF spirit to get the user into the center of everything we do. This co-creation strategy makes FF more competitive, ensure FF product to be more advanced in the market, especially the quick alignment with the evolving market needs and user desires. So given this partnership, then how we engage each other between FF and the users? You can see FF provide the vehicle as a platform. FF provide the industry experts and the technical support, and eventually FF share the benefit to the users. Meanwhile, the users will purchase or lease the car and then they spend the time to use our product and then share the feedback to us so as we can utilize this in the future, uh, the next generation product enhancement. Meanwhile, they will share their social impact and social connection to FF for FF brand awareness. It's simple. So as a result, and also the goal of co-creation, so FF can get our brand awareness very quick. 
And also we can build up the strong long-term user loyalty and user trust. And meanwhile, we can get our product earlier engaged with the luxury users and the target users. Eventually, we share the benefits each other. So that is the co-creation. Next page, please. So um, co-creation is a creative idea, but it is based on the best market practice by the industry pioneers, like what Google and Apple and DJI did. So you can see Google launched their developer platform in uh, 2012. The users have earned more than 100 billion US dollars. And then Apple launched their uh, developer platform in 2008. They have shared more than 320 billion US dollars to their developers. And then DJI is a newcomer in this area, but they are running quickly. They just launched their developer platform in 2022. Uh, they have collected more than 10,000 developers and uh, more than 3 million active in uh, uh, SDK. So that is unbelievable result. And then if we deep dive into the co-creation process, we can say it's simple and similar. Just four steps. The first step is register to this company, no matter the user to pay or not pay. And then the second step is to purchase device. The third step is just to start the development works. And then eventually the first step is to get the benefits in a mandatory value basis to the users. So FF doing the things similar, but we enhance it. We make it deeper and wider. We launch our co-creation activity in a task basis. We offer the task, the user takes the task, and then enjoy the co-creation activity and then get benefits back very quick. So that is different. And we are doing the things on top of them, we're doing things more. Oh, next page. And then that is the strategy. Then what we have achieved in the past couple of months, right after the FM9 final launch. So you can see we have the expand our co-creation activity to a lot of areas, including, for example, entertainment, sports, entrepreneurs, luxury goods, and especially the racing area, which is really showing the strong power of FI product. So all the celebrities is driving our car and enjoying our co-creation activity. In total, they have more than 200 million fans, which is really benefits to i5 brand awareness. I would like to give you some sample. Chris Brown driving our car on a daily basis. Right after the, he purchased the car, and they post one post for i5 product. And then just in within two, three days, we got 4.6 million viewers and engagement for i5 brand awareness. So does Jason Abraham, another one million immediately. And also uh, Justin Bell, based on his social connection, he secured us the interview with the chairman of Pebble Beach in our Pebble Beach event. So normally it will take a large cost there, but we spend there. So that is the power of co-creation. And there is still a lot of uh, 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 co-creation activity ongoing, I will not repeat them, but they are using our product, they are giving the feedback to us for our next generation product enhancement. And a lot of other resources into our delivery event. So we believe we can get more value through the co-creation activity, like what is ongoing. So that is co-creation. Thank you. Then I will hand over to Matthias. Thank you, Terry. So now you get a, a good glimpse of uh, what we achieved, what we're doing actually. Let's go back in time. And starting in 2014, 2014, the company was founded by YT Jha, who is uh, with the company today and serving as our chief product and user ecosystem uh, officer. In 2015, we were operating in stealth mode and launched our first uh, mule vehicle, which was uh, embodying 
our VPA, our variable pl platform architecture, and also our propulsion system to get the first learning, which culminated in 2016 at CES into showing to the world what could be a potential product based on the VPA with uh, launching the FF01 groundbreaking vehicle, which is on display here. If you turn to the right, you can see it. A very attractive vehicle. <clears throat> In 2017, we had a busy year. In the beginning of 2017, we introduced the FF91 with all the features which are now going into, or which have been going into production. So we realized what we promised in 2017 already. Uh, every, no, not every, many other OEMs were just listening to what we announced there and then incorporating in, into their product planning and realized it as well. So uh, not all of what we have announced in 2017, which was outstanding, is still outstanding. So we are working on getting to the forefront, forefront Again, what did we do in 2017 as well? We run Pikes Peak with the technology we have developed and uh, basically we broke the record of going up the hill for electric vehicles close to production by 23 seconds, faster than a uh, Model S at that time. And what was most uh, astonishing basically, the Model S needed to be cooled down after going up the hill uh, the battery needed to go on ice packs, and our vehicle was going down the hill uh, without having the need to cool down or was just driven down again by our driver. <coughs> what we did as well, we signed a lease for uh, Hanford, where we started to establish our manufacturing. And then in the end of 2017, we closed our Series A financing which allowed us to run fast in 2018. We were running in, in six to eight months to get everything lined up to have a first pre-production car uh, getting off the line in Hanford. In 2019, we were running out of money a little bit, but we carried on uh, getting gamma vehicles built, which allowed us then in the following period, so that was basically the first half of 2019, we produced these cars. And we were limited in what we uh, were able to do on the hardware side, which was a big advantage for our software team. So for the following one and a half years, we were fully dedicated and concentrated on developing and maturing our software architecture. And it's not, compared as with other OEMs, something where we just stitch together what comes from system suppliers. It's in-house developed with a huge uh, vertical integration. And so it, it took quite some time to get that somehow to work together and, and deliver what we were envisioning in 2017 already. In 2020, the whole industry and ourselves were hit by uh, COVID. And thanks to a PPP loan, we were able to keep the company afloat. Uh, in the end of 2020, we decided to go for the next round of financing in the company by partnering up with a, with a spec party, which we identified. And then the negotiations were leading to a close of uh, an agreement in the beginning of 2021. Our chosen partner, PSEC, signed the contract with us in January or early February, and then we took uh, the merger to an IPO in, in July 2021, raising close to 1 billion, uh, which gave us net proceeds of something like 650 million, uh, cutting away our past dues. Then with that, we started to speed up, getting our supply base coming back and putting the car on wheels. So this was taking the time until uh, 2023. In the year 2022, we unveiled the first uh, production intent vehicle, leading to the final product, as you can see it on, the, on your left-hand side, sitting there. So coming to 2023, 
let's change the scale, I'm not talking about years, talking about months. In the beginning of 2023, in January, we signed an agreement with the city of Wangang in China to move our China headquarters there and embrace our dual home market DNA and strategy. In March, we announced the start of production. So some of the people here in the room have been in Hanford pushing the car into the final assembly line, and we started to build the first vehicle, which was finished then with the help of many, many people uh, in the mid of April. In May, we were able to hold our final launch event and showcase the FF91 2.0 Futurist Alliance to the world. And I'm pretty sure that you, some of you have seen uh, the videos we shared with the world at the time. Then shortly after, in June, we had our SOD1 uh, milestone, sharing the vehicles with, with, the, with the first round of uh, co-creation users. And we, are, uh, invi we were inviting people to a track day in Willow Springs. With this track day, as you can imagine, and I think we have been in the press for a long time, not really being a real company, being more of a PowerPoint company, with these question marks in mind, people showed up at the track day, and after driving the car, and after sitting in the car, uh, the concerns were gone. So basically, the, the people left the car smiling uh, from, one we, from one ear to the other, and, and basically being convinced about uh, the power of of performance the vehicle is providing. <coughs> we then carried on to finish off our uh, self-certification program. We run through all the necessary crash programs. We got all our US DOT certifications on part markings when necessary and uh, fulfilled all the legal requirements. In some areas, you have to wait until your supplier is running through the final loops and the bigger supplier uh, the harder the time to get there. So we closed that off at the end of July with a confirmation that we have a road legal product. This road legal product then was sitting in Hanford waiting for the last parts and we took it through a quality loop and uh, a refinement to achieve the right level of quality and handed it over on, I think it was August 12th to the first uh, co-creation user in which is a private motor collection in uh, close to Newport Beach, Cosa Mesa. And since then, we have continued to sign up with partners. We handed out additional vehicles. Up till today, we have delivered seven vehicles, and uh, we will have a, a vehicle delivery scheduled for later today in the afternoon to hand over to a very good friend of the company, uh, eighth vehicle. We have invested so far three billion into this company. And most of it really went into technology. It culminated in 660 patents filed, which we're still holding. Once it was evaluated to be 900 to 1.2 billion of value in, in US dollar and, and compared to, to uh, as well-known companies like Toyota, for example, the, the level of value and uh, I don't remember exactly what's the, what's the term, Chris, you have it, uh, no, Phil, you have it, uh, the rating was the freshness of, of the invention was on a higher level than the Toyota inventions, which were from a number perspective somehow similar. And we can share this report if you're interested. So we are improving the product on a weekly basis, especially what Terry shared with our co-creators. So we have a co-creator community from the different fields of use. You, you have seen we have uh, existing and former race drivers helping, helping us. We had uh, one uh, record holder of West Willow Springs. Uh, we, we met him by accident in Willow Springs. and. We invited him to drive the car, and he was not really uh, very keen to sit into a car of that size. Drove the car, and then he signed up to, 
to work with us as a contractor to improve the product. So what we were able to deliver, what we were able to put together is really impressive and you will have the chance to, to see and experience that later uh, after we finished this meeting. So what is next? Next is, and I've been with the company for more than seven years, I've been running the program one time, was kicked in my shins and dripping over because we were running out of money. The same happened to my colleague and friend, Phil. So we are fed up with that. The main focus is getting this company independent of outside money, driving it to a financial sustainability and stability. That's our main focus for uh, the near term and mid term, to drive the company to a profitability and a, a cash flow break even, that we do not have to worry about the lifeline of the company any longer when we are looking into new products. The second focus is to continuously improve technology. And as Phil mentioned, and also John mentioned, the differentiation is not so much on the hardware side. The hardware we have put together, we will carry on optimizing, reducing cost, and making it more capable. But the big thing is looking to, to marry software intelligence and then carry on with our portfolio as we have laid out it. The next one is maximizing the market penetration in the ultimate tech luxury markets. So what takes us out of the competition is the product we have realized. So we followed the direction and the vision of YT to start at the top instead of starting at the bottom and then crawling up. And we have a unique product which stands out even when companies accepted players in, in the ultra luxury market like Rolls Royce, Bentley are coming with electrified product. They will lack the level in, of integration we were able to put together between software, hardware and intelligence. As we can see with all the traditional OEMs, they're struggling to get to the level what Tesla has realized in, in a uh, combination of software and hardware in, in, in performance. So we focus very much to stay in this market for the beginning, to set up our brand, to get to the level of recognition. On one hand, on the other hand, if you consider the volumes we are able to, to build and sell in that market, there are, if you compare us with a Lucid or a Rivian or a Tesla, we are talking about homeopathic volumes, very low volumes, which enables us to manage our costs to get these vehicles produced. So our path to get to a cash flow break even is far shorter than of the other companies because the burden we have built up with the organization is, is smaller. So we, we have, we have uh, capitalized for a volume of 10,000 units a year and our overhead structure in, in Hanford is supporting this 10,000 units. It doesn't support 150,000 units and we have to fill it because we're only selling 10,000. So our path to get there that we are able to produce less cars than the market demands is far shorter than with our competition. <coughs> also, the small volume gives us the possibility to go into markets where we would need to spend millions and millions of dollars to enter, to enter the markets when we could, would go big scale. We can go to, as we announced, we are looking into uh, the Middle East. We can consider that with a low hurdle because getting single vehicles into a market like the Middle East is not that complicated. Getting it, getting it into Europe with a single car type approval is not that complicated. So we will need to adjust our timing for entering the, the China market because with the volumes we are considering in China, we need to fulfill all the steps of a, 
a regular homologation and certification, which we do not need to do with the other markets. There we can piggyback on the self-certification of the US market. That allows us to get into the world far easier with less investment than if we would uh, go with a volume of 5, 10, 12,000 cars per year. Looking further in the future, we will see how the markets are reacting. And based on the acceptance and the demand, we will establish local R&D, local manufacturing, and local supply chain wherever it makes sense. We have, with our dual uh, DNA, home market DNA, looking at uh, different markets like China, US, Europe, you have product elements which are completely different from a, from a user acceptance and perception. So we want to harvest the knowledge of the local resources in regards of product definition, product marketing, as well as product development. And that will happen there. With that, I think we can showcase our IAI functionality very soon. In our earnings call, we mentioned already that we are planning and going to the UAE. We will hold a press conference on the 23rd of this month in Abu Dhabi in the framework of the Formula One Grand Prix happening there. And we are planning to showcase our vehicle in, in the UAE market. So, and stay tuned to learn what we are announcing with this press conference. And I think with that, we can look into Hanford. Because we are not going to Hanford, I captured a video and uh, I'm taking you now virtually through the manufacturing plant. And I'm getting some signs from the background. I don't know exactly what it means. Ah, and before that comes, Jonathan has to share some financials with us. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. Uh, nice to see all of you. My name is Jonathan Morocco. I'm the interim CFO here at Faraday Future. So, so far you've heard a lot about the vehicle and the history of our company. But now I'd like to provide a discussion uh, of our market opportunity and the investment opportunity within Faraday Future. So first, I'll start with market opportunity and demand. Obviously, there's been a lot of pressure on the electric vehicle market, um, but we believe our brand is positioned far above the crowded low to mid-market electric vehicle space that's currently experiencing a price war. And so rather than competing with the likes of Lucid, Rivian, or Tesla, we believe thanks to our technology features that we compete most closely with Ferrari, Maybach, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, et cetera, whose portfolio of electric vehicles are limited at best. And while the traditional electric vehicle manufacturers that I mentioned are now prioritizing revenue, revenue growth over margins, we're optimistic that we can pursue both. So geographically, first we're targeting the United States and particularly Southern California, Miami, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, these are the major luxury automotive markets in the United States. We're building up our infrastructure within Southern California, and we'll continue to do so as we enter new markets. Now, this infrastructure includes employees on the ground, mobile service vans, and events celebrating our owners and promoting our brand. Internationally, we of course will look to China, but also the Middle East. First with China. China is the largest electric vehicle market in the world, and there's also tremendous wealth within China. There's about 1,000 billionaires and over 6 million millionaires in China. The electric, um, rather the luxury vehicle market in China is worth $150 billion per year. So it's obviously a very highly attractive end market for the FF91, 
And I believe the FF91 is an ideal vehicle to own if you have a private driver, which many wealthy individuals in China do. It's incredibly spacious. If you're on a Zoom call or doing work in the back, it feels like you're at your office. If you're watching TV or a movie in the back, it feels like you're at home relaxing on your couch. We also, within China, intend to take advantage of the lower cost to manufacture the vehicle. And we believe we can quickly and meaningfully reduce our bomb cost if we begin manufacturing in China. Now on to the Middle East and the UAE specifically. You know, obviously, this is a very, very exciting market for us. In that geography, there's, of course, the huge desire to diversify um, their economies away from oil and gas production. And we, are think, uh, we believe we're the perfect vehicle to help in that transition. And the UAE is, of course, uh, an ultra-luxury vehicle end market. And electric vehicles only are making up you know, 1%, less than 5%, call it, of the UAE vehicle market. So in both markets, China and the UAE, we're also optimistic we can find a strategic partner which will be invaluable from both a funding and operating standpoint. Next, I'd like to talk about near-term liquidity and short-term and medium-term funding opportunities. So from a funding point of view, we've been accessing the ATM in recent weeks to fund our business. It's been a strong source of funding, and we've been using it judiciously to limit the impact on the stock price. We're hesitant to draw more than we need in the immediate term, given our current stock valuation. We've also been supported by our convertible note holders, who have provided meaningful capital over the past year. But we're also doing what we can to move away from these financings and are always looking to improve our options and terms. So we're in early talks with these note holders to either restructure our existing agreements or to limit the impact of the conversions within those agreements. What we're most excited about and focused on is non-dilutive financing opportunities. First, I'll touch on is intellectual property-based lending. So as Matthias mentioned, we had our intellectual property portfolio, portfolio valued at about $1 billion back in 2019. And we're excited and believe we can use this as collateral to really bring in significant non-dilutive funding. We're also in early discussions around financing using our equipment as collateral. We have a lot of equipment in our Hanford manufacturing facility. And then, of course, we're also looking at supply chain and working capital financing. Now, these are critical because getting a handle on our supply chain is vital to allow us to grow. It's imperative that we manage our cash conversion cycle in order to lay the foundation for growth. And so to do so, we can either work with our existing suppliers and, and attempt to negotiate better terms for ourselves or work to establish new financing agreements such as supply chain financing. But until we really establish meaningful volume with our suppliers, we'll likely utilize and rely on supply chain financing to promote growth and to improve our cash conversion cycle. But we believe these suppliers would be more amenable to discussing better terms once we ramp volume up. On to the next slide. I'd like to discuss valuation. Our current market capitalization is less than $50 million, closer to $40 million, I believe. We have about $100 million of net debt, so an enterprise value of $140, $145 million. Obviously, we think this market capitalization does not reflect our true valuation. And I'll get into why I believe that to be the case now. So let's discuss ways to think about how to value a business such as ours. First, we can look at the cost to recreate the business. As you've heard, we put $3 billion into the company to get it to where it is today. Now, this is nine years of development, more than 650 patents, and an intellectual property portfolio, like I mentioned, previously valued at about $1 billion. We've been a trailblazer in terms of automotive features. We're seeing ideas that we pioneered years ago only now appearing in some vehicles. And we will continue to push the technological and product feature envelope for vehicle design and production. Another classic way to you know, value a business is book value, although in our case I would argue this is um, a more conservative view given its historical snapshot. But let's take a look at it. And looking at our balance sheet, we have 560, rather $580 million of assets. Liabilities of $320 million, so a book value of about $260 million. And again, compare that to our market capitalization. It's far and above. Another potential valuation 
technique would be to look at revenue multiples. So as we guided to on our 3Q23 earnings call, we're targeting 1,000 vehicles produced next year, subject to availability of requisite capital, supply chain capacity and stability, and necessary permits. But if we assume we sell those 1,000 vehicles in 2024, assume an average MSRP of, call it $270,000 per vehicle, and say 75% of those are outright sales rather than leases, you know, we're talking already more than $200 million of revenue. And you can take a look at you know, forward revenue multiples of some of the other EV manufacturers, 5X, 10X, and other luxury vehicle manufacturers to get a sense of potential valuation. Now, as mentioned, management believes we are undervalued and subject to stockholder approval. Many of us have committed to purchase shares of FFIE because we believe in the long-term value of the company. Next, I'll talk about cost cuts and control improvements. First on the fixed cost side. In the third quarter, we embarked on an aggressive cost cutting campaign focusing on our GNA expenses. This is part of a continued cost cutting exercise and we believe the efforts of this campaign will be seen in our fourth quarter results. Now to the bomb. We're also working very hard to reduce our bomb cost. Some of this will come naturally with volume and improvements in manufacturing efficiency. But we are also targeting specific components of the bomb, switching suppliers and insourcing the production where av available and where cost effective. And this is yielding meaningful, fruitful results. And I'll give you one concrete example. There was one particular component of the bomb that was costing us $60,000. We brought the production in-house, and now it's costing us $10,000. So this $50,000 savings on a single component within bomb is, is unheard of. And it shows how much low-hanging fruit still exists in terms of reducing the bomb in the near term for us. Next, I'll focus on systems and capability buildup. So I'm also very focused on improving our internal systems. We went public via DSPAC, so naturally some of our systems are not as mature as they would be had we gone public via traditional IPO or direct listing. But we are improving these systems and look forward to the implementation of new systems now, these will no doubt help in our analysis and decision making and will also help in reducing labor costs within GNA. We have better processes, we're utilizing SAP, and we're working with industry veterans from some of the largest automotive OEMs in the world to help structure and implement a full ERP system. These improved controls are also helping us remediate our material weaknesses, which we continue to target ahead of our next annual report on Form 10K. I'm very, very excited about the prospects of our company. From an operational perspective, Faraday is the most mature it's been in its history. You know, we're delivering vehicles, we're generating revenue, and we're slowly but surely increasing our total production volume. We have a new senior management team that is passionate and capable and committed to making Faraday Future a success. And from an investment point of view and risk reward perspective, I think there is strong value proposition in investing at our current valuation. Like I mentioned, our current market capitalization is less than $50 million, but if we're successful in executing in the coming few years, our market capitalization could be many, many times what it is today. And there's a slide up here I'll quickly walk through uh, why we're differentiated and why it's compelling outside of the reasons I just mentioned. Um, but these are many things you've heard already, but I just would like to summarize and highlight them. first unique tech luxury offering, blue ocean market. $3 billion invested to date. We are now a revenue generating company and ready to scale. Incredible artificial intelligence within our vehicles. We also have revolutionary proprietary technology. I've discussed the patents and the IP portfolio. We also have in-house manufacturing uh, in Hanford, local manufacturing, U.S. manufactured is something we're very proud of. Next, we have realistic, achievable business model where we're targeting cash flow break even as early as the end of 2025. And of course, number eight is the unique dual home market strategy. Access to the China market is invaluable, not just from an end market, but also from a manufacturing base. And last uh, is what Matthias alluded to before introducing me is a walkthrough 
of our Hanford manufacturing facility. Thank you. Welcome to Hanford. I will be your tour guide today. I'm Matthias Eid, the global CEO of Faraday Future. And we are in our FFIE factory in California, in the middle, right between San Francisco and Los Angeles. We have chosen this place on purpose to serve the two most important markets here on the West Coast. And I will take you through all the different locations we have in our manufacturing and the actual status of being prepared. So let me give you some details and some uh, figures to this factory we are going into. It's a one million square foot factory. We have installed a fully automated body shop, a fully automated closures line. We have a fully automated paint shop with e-coating tanks and with the fi pin final paint, a top coating. So all to the latest and greatest standards of technology, delivering us the right level of uh, pre-product going into final assembly. Final assembly is set up not automated because we are producing a high quality product. So we need the craftsmanship of our workers to go into making sure that we achieve the highest quality ever for our users. <coughs> and we are using this facility in future also to be able to expand to a bigger capacity once we are able to get additional funding and investment uh, secured to allow this further improvements. Let me take you in. Thank you. So let me take you into the first step of our operation. So for now we're doing a 100% incoming inspection. I'll introduce Juan who is our in incoming inspection lead. Juan, good morning. Good morning. Here we see the crates with the glass being delivered and you take us through the process. So we get the crates out here, we do the inspection 100%, make sure there's no cracks, scratches, anything, no defects and ready to be on the line for an easy install, no defects. So this is the most important element of getting the production up and running. So once we are uh, hitting our peak volume of two jobs per hour, we will not have the need to do a 100% inspection. We can follow an industry standard. But for now, until we are there, we are focusing on really inspecting each and every part to make sure we deliver the right level of quality to our users. Let me take you to our video wall to give you a little bit of an overview. I spoke about where we are located. We are right in the middle between Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco, strategically placed in Hanford, uh, close to the Sequoia National Park. We picked the location to be in the best spot for the California market. So looking at the overall Hanford factory, as I said, it's a 1 million square feet. And we have in here, we have all our warehousing, we have the body shop, uh, paint shop, vehicle assembly, so we cover all the necessary elements of building the vehicle. When we have built out the facility to the two top per hour, uh, then we will occupy the whole building. For now, we are looking into uh, an area where we are driving up the, the manufacturing capacity to 0.5 jobs per hour. So we will be able to achieve a peak volume of two and a half thousand units a year. In the two jobs per hour, we will be able to do let me take you now to the body shop. Hello, Matthias. You will take us through. So, Omit, you have been with the company for quite a time. So That's right. Now let's, let's take us through the body shop and share what we have set up here and for what purpose. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, right where we are, this is start of our underbody which we go the underbody main line, and then we move to the framing. Um, we have two buildings here in the body shop. This side is 
for all the body parts and assemblies and the other side of the building is where we build our closures and we hang the closures on the body. Let's walk through the line and I will show you the details here. Sure. Um, basically, on on left hand side of me, you will see all the sub assemblies that has to be completed um, before we can merge it together and join it into the underbody and the framing. This is the first station of the underbody main line. Um, you know, Matthias, our, our body shop is very sophisticated and we have used very high level of automation, not only to achieve the production target, but also the foundation of equality for the car is the body involved. When we have a good body, dimensionally correct, we will have a good car, good finished car. Fit and finish is going to be um, the major challenge for all the automotive suppliers. But when you build the body correctly, then you will minimize all those challenges in the, in the road. Um, we start with the underbody sub-assemblies. We load it into the first station. The automation pick it up and then we move to the following automated stations. As you are aware, we do have so many different material used in our body. This is due to not only provide the durability and safety, but also we use a lot of aluminum to have the light weights. Because we have different materials, our joining technology in the body shop is also very complicated. We will use many different types of joining technology from different suppliers to join the different material together. This is our, one of our most complicated cells. It's called D-ring assembly. Yeah. And we are at the last stage of the D-ring. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the major joining techniques we are using, which is the um, base of our safety uh, structural uh, strength of the car is structural adhesive. Yeah. And we're going to make sure the adhesive is applied correctly and right amount. And as you see here, uh, we are using the automated adhesive system to apply adhesive on the um, important sub-assemblies by robots. Okay. And he is now teaching um, that final bit of adhesive and then we can apply the adhesive and complete the build of the sub-assembly. It's basically coming out of this drums, right? Exactly. This is our yeah. uh, pumping system which pump the adhesive through the cell and the robots have the parts on the gripper and move it around and we get the adhesive applied okay. on the parts automatically. Um, this is our closure build cells. Um, the cell on, on my left is all our hemming. Yeah. Uh, we're doing the um, doors, liftgate and fender, we, and uh, you know, yes, our fender, doors and liftgate, we do hemming on those sub-assemblies. Okay. Uh, those are the welding cells, which we build the door inners and uh, liftgate inner sub-assemblies, and then we move them here to the hemming cell to hem them out together. This one is the door inner, rear side, front, and uh, again, in our uh, closures assembly as well, we are using the adhesive yeah. to make sure that uh, you know, it passes the safety requirements. Um, one of the door inner left hand side that we, as you see, they are applying adhesive on the reinforcement and yeah. then they weld it to the inner panel and the completed inner assemblies will move to the hemming cell and will get joined to the outer, outer panels. Okay. And, you know, when we have in these cells all the closures completed, we'll move it to the hang-on line and then the body comes from the other side and we hang all those completed closures to the body with the desired gap and flushness that's um, defined for the cars. Okay. All right, that's, uh, that's going to be the, the end of the body shop tour. Thank you so much for Thank your you, time. Thank you, Yeah. Thank you. So in the next station will be then uh, our e-coding and I'll take you there in a minute. So now let me take you through the e-code process. The bodies coming from the hang-on line are transferred to a crane 
and then the crane is taking it through the different bars. In total, we have seven tanks. Six of the seven tanks are part of the process. The seventh one is just for maintenance, not being in a position that we have to break the process. So the different steps is we are rinsing the body, we are cleaning the body and preparing it for the final e-coat, which is happening in this bath. Here, as you can see, it gets the lovely color. And then after that, there is another rinse before the body then is transferred out of the e-code line and is getting prepared to run through the oven to cure the adhesives and make sure that the body is baked. We have materials which are reaching their rigidity only after they are baked. So aluminum is hardening through that process and also the adhesive is hardening through that process and with that we prepare the bodies for the coating, the final coating, the deck coating and with that we have then the right body going into the final assembly. The next step will be after we have uh, passed the ovens which are in front of me. If you can follow my view then you can see here the ovens. The body is going into the oven, the door is shut, and then it goes through the process and will go into the final paint. So now we are entering the area where the miracles are happening. We got an e-coated body, which is not really very beautiful, and we have here our top artists turning an e-coated body into something beautiful. Leonard. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. Welcome to the paint shop. Thank you. Um, so the first step is we're looking at our e-coat sanding booth. So we'll walk over here. So and I see the body is already sealed. So we're making sure that all the water and uh, wind noise tightness is, is achieved. Yeah, to ensure that the, the bodies are watertight. Okay, take me to the next steps. Okay, yeah, and let's let walk over to our robotic painting cell. Okay. Matthias, let me show you our robotic painting cell. Um, all the painting will be automatically applied in one cell, primer, base coat, clear coat. Looking forward to that. I've seen it a lot of times in building it up, but never in motion. Yeah, so today we'll see it in motion. Perfect. Um, so all layers of paint will be applied in this cell, robotically applied. It looks nice how the robots are covered in, in foil, just making sure there's no dirt going into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're ready, we'll go down and we'll actually yes, see a paint. Think we're ready. Okay. Awesome. So these are six axis robots on a rail. The entire exterior time is about three minutes. Now let me take you to the vehicle assembly line. And I want to introduce Jeff Robinson, our head of vehicle assembly, joining us back to help us with setting up the final assembly. And he will take us now through the process he has installed. The last time I have been here, this was uh, an area where we have stored all the parts. In the meantime, the manufacturing team has reconfigured the whole assembly line. It looks completely different. So take me through it and, and explain what you have done. Yeah, absolutely. So what this represents is the next step in the, the maturity of the process and the strategic development of our manufacturing uh, system. 
So for, from a strategic standpoint, what we're looking at doing is increasing volume. And to do that, we needed to go from a bay build, which we did currently, to an inline process. In the inline process, the vehicle comes out of paint and joins the back of the line and comes up through the system. What this enables us to do is really look at our processes and how we, how we expand those processes to achieve our goal of early next year reaching 0.5 GPH. So how many stations did you install here? So we went from seven stations to 10. Okay, that right. looks like an increase in, in outcome. Right, so all of this is in support of increased capacity. Yeah. Like I said, early next year, 0.5 JPH. But what this allows us to do is really study our, our processes and develop more accurate tack times and cycle times. Along with that, what this gives us the ability to do is engage the materials team so they can really start looking at their line side feeds Yes. and what that strategy needs to look like to support uh, half a job an hour over here early next year. So uh, as we're increasing capacity, we're also increasing our knowledge on how to build the vehicle at a higher rate. Yeah. Right. So what this gives us the opportunity to do is at some point in time in the future when we do go to two jobs an hour, the transition won't be nearly as difficult because we've already got so much data yeah. and knowledge gathered through what we've done here that the transition from 0.5 to 2 JPH and that ramp curve will be substantially less painful than it could be for us as an organization yeah. and for the company as a whole. Okay, Jeff, let's have a walk and look at the cars. Yeah. So one of the last processes that we do after the car's got the subframes in and we put it on wheels, we put the seats in, we start to button up the interior. Yeah. We do the glass set and we put the door panels on. Okay. From here, it'll go to uh, water test. Okay. For validation. After that, it goes out and then goes through the rest of the validation processes, the roll test, the ADAS calibration, and everything that goes along with putting the finishing touches on the vehicle. Perfect. At that point in time, after the calibration, it goes for its dynamic drive. Okay. Where we actually exercise all the functions in the vehicle, lane departure, cruise control, and everything that you need to have the vehicle in motion for. Okay. After that, That's good. after that, it goes through the final quality audits and inspections, yeah. any corrections that need to be made are made at that point in time, any corrections that need to be made are made at that point in time, final validation or factory gate, if you want to call it that, and then off it goes to our next customer. Perfect. Right. So I hope you enjoyed walking the, the facility, our FFIE factory, California, as much as I did. It's always a pleasure for me to come up to Hanford and enjoy the progress we are making with setting up our manufacturing processes in a way that they are delivering vehicles first off, first right off line instead of going into continuous loops of reworking cars to achieve the right quality. The team up here is extremely passionate. We have uh, with Mr. Ning, I want to introduce Mr. Ning, Nice he, he is my man on the ground. He's making sure that we are delivering the best, pro, best ever product. My child and I'm, Yes, and I'm very grateful having him here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank and you. have a good time.